The views expressed on the Final Straw Radio do not necessarily reflect those of Asheville FM, Friends of Community Radio, or any of the affiliate radio stations airing the show. Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFM LP at 103.3 FM in Asheville, North Carolina. This is The Final Straw, and I'm William Goodenough. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions, comments, or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net. Also, if you're interested in rebroadcasting any episode or segment of the show, you're free to do so. Just send us an email if you end up using any content. If you care to, you can send us letters at our new address, which is The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. The show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's catalog of books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop. Cindy Milstein is an anarchist, activist, and author who has been touring the past few months with Rebellious Morning, The Collective Work of Grief, published last year by AK Press. The book is a compilation of essays by various authors about loss and its myriad forms experienced under cis-hetero patriarchy in a capitalist settler colonialism, anti-black and otherwise racist ableist society. After Cindy came to speak at Firestorm Books in October 2018, we sat down for a long chat. In this first hour, Cindy speaks, shares thoughts on the following topics and more. A prior book that they put together, Taking Sides from AK Press 2015, the process of making rebellious morning and creating brave spaces for engaging with hard topics, prefiguration during the anarchist summer camp that they helped to organize called the Institute for Advanced Troublemaking, and multi-generational care and caretaking in anarchist communities. When I say the conversation was long, I mean that we recorded for about two and a half hours. We present the first hour here for radio audiences. We're also going to do an out-of-the-ordinary thing for us, which is to release the second half of the interview alongside of it. You'll find part two linked at thefinalstarradio.noblogs.org in our blog post, so you can listen to the both back-to-back if you so choose. Next week, this second half will air for radio audiences, but our podcast listeners will get a special treat because in place of a new Final Straw episode, we'll be sharing a new episode of our occasional tech security from an anarchist perspective podcast, Air 451. So stay tuned for the voice of someone engaging in spreading tools of encryption for free to help you to protect your right to whisper on the internet. You can check out Cindy's writings at their blog, CB Milstein. Dot wordpress.com, and you can find their books up at akpress.org and anarchiststudies.org. Before Cindy speaks, we're going to share a few announcements. First off, we're very happy to announce that we'll be airing this Sunday at 1 p.m. Pacific Time for the first of many broadcasts on the airwaves of KFUG LP, Crescent City in Del Norte County in California. KFUG broadcasts at 101.1 FM and streams from their website, kfugradio.org. Thank you so much for giving us the chance. And we look forward to hearing back from a new audience. If you're listening to this as a podcast and wish that we were on the airwaves of a station near you, drop us a line via our social media or at the Final Straw Radio at RiseUp.net, and we can help you think through how to make this happen. Our show is FCC Radio Ready at 59 square free minutes a week for download for free at archive.org, and you can find out more at our website by clicking the Broadcasting tab. Next, here's an update from Resistance in Canada. We're pleased to share a clip of the statement from two anarchists caught up in the Lock Street case. The Lock Street riot, as it has become known, occurred in March 2018 when, during the weekend of the Steel City Book Fair in Hamilton, Ontario, about 30 individuals marched through the Kirkendale neighborhood. Some lit fireworks, attacked luxury cars, and smashed out gentrifying businesses' windows on that street, causing an estimated $100,000 in damage to property. This led to a backlash against anarchists in Hamilton, including against the anarchist social space known as the Tower, which had its windows smashed out and was pressured by police to change locations, as well as arbitrary arrest and detention of anarchists in the area. As the cases move forward concerning the Lock Street affair, the plea has been entered and accepted. Cedar is in jail currently. 
sentenced to 12 months with four months served, eight more to go. They will hopefully be out in five to six. Another one is on house arrest for three months, followed by three months of curfew. A third person from Montreal is to be sentenced on January 1st and will likely have a four to five month sentence. The remaining five were let off with varying conditional charges and diversion. The full text of the statement can be found at north-shore.info, titled Still Not Sorry on the Plea Deal in the Lock Street Case. You can also find ways to support those facing repression and jail time from the Lock Street Case at that site as well. There was also an interview on this case released on From Embers in two parts, each about an hour long, and it provides some good perspectives on Lock Street and the struggles in Hamilton ongoing. We've never had any interest in evoking the discourse of democratic rights or the concepts of guilt and innocence to navigate the violence of the state. We refuse to place ourselves within it and do not want to do anything that props up the frameworks that create and perpetuate divisions, like the criminal versus the law-abiding citizen, the good versus the bad activist, peaceful versus violent protester, etc. These serve the interests of power and only harm us. The statement later goes on to say, We reject any division between ideas and actions, and we stand by all the activities that took place on the weekend of March the 3rd, the book fair, the demo, and more all those acts that were criminalized, and all those that weren't. While we have no interest in making distinctions between those who broke shit and those who didn't, it's important to note that this was not, and it rarely ever is, just about a singular action. Those of us facing charges in Hamilton weren't primarily targeted on the basis of breaking anything, but rather were targeted because we visibly and persistently push anarchist ideas and practices. Ideas and practices that are fundamentally at odds with the vision the ruling class and their lackeys have for the city. We could choose to be outraged about the criminalization of protests and of routine organizing tasks like distributing leaflets, but this would be to say that the state is wrong to perceive those acts as threats to its interests. Every reading group, public meal, gathering, or march is as much a part of our refusal to have our lives managed by bureaucrats and capitalists as the act of throwing rocks through a window. From Embers is a member of the Channel Zero Network of English Language Anarchist Podcasts. Here's a jingle from another member of CZN. We want to thank each and every person that has recently donated to the It's Going Down Winter Fundraiser. And before you even knew what you had, you you patented it and packaged it and slapped it on a plastic lunchbox, and now you're selling it. You want to sell it. Well, well, because of your support, we are now halfway to meeting our goal of raising $10,000 by the end of 2018. You think that kind of automation is easy? Or cheap? So... If you want to support Revolutionary Autonomous Media, please don't hesitate to log on and donate. Access main program. Access main security. Access main program grid. Ah, ah, ah. You didn't say the magic word. Ah, please! Ah, ah. God! Ah, ah. I hate this hacker ah, crap! Ah. And donating is easy. Just go to itsgoingdown.org slash shop and sign up to become a monthly supporter. Grab some awesome swag or make a one-time donation. Hold on to your butt. And now, back to the show. The Final Straw is also a proud member of the International A Radio Network. The latest episode of our monthly English language podcast is up and ready for download at our website, in our stream, or at a-radio-network.org, where you'll hear updates from international solidarity with Brazil's social movements from Germany, anti-repression news from Germany via Slovenia, updates about radical struggles in the UK, and about the killing and resistance following this of a Mapuche activist in so-called Chile, occupied Walmapu. In a quick prisoner-related announcement. There's a request that listeners and concerned parties contact the officials at David Wake Wade Correctional Center in Homer, Louisiana, and request and express concern for the treatment of Jeremy Rickard at the hands of the guards. He's apparently been beaten while in solitary confinement for his continued protests about the terrible terrible circumstances under which people are held at David Wade Correctional. Uh, Jeremy Rickard is also found at prisoner number 511078 
and prison guards have allegedly beaten him and sprayed him with chemical agents, taken his clothes and personal property, and placed him in a paper gown for up to 30 days in an empty cell. If you're concerned about Mr. Rickard's care, you can contact Jerry Goodwin, who's the warden at the facility, by calling 318-927-0400. And again, expressing concern about the treatment of the prisoner named Jeremy Rickard, R-I-C-A-R-D, whose number is 511. If you care to support the Final Straw Radio, please consider a one-time donation via our PayPal or recurring donation via our Patreon or LibrePay. We have items on the Patreon and in our Big Cartel web store to thank supporters, including stickers, buttons, t-shirts, and zines. Great timing for the socially required gift-giving holiday season. We never charge for our audio work. So if you feel like you can kick something back cash-wise our way, we really appreciate it. Find out more at our website by clicking the support button. One last announcement. The Unistoten Camp is an indigenous blockade in so-called British Columbia on unceded Wet'suwet'en land to block tar sands being transported to the west for export. The tar sands would be coming from so-called Alberta, and if they are burned will be another significant contributor to human-fueled climate change as a very carbon-intensive, poisonous, and energy-ineffective source of power. The Unistoten Camp faced a court hearing on Monday, December 10th, giving them less than a week to desist the blockade and allow Trans-Canada the pipeline across their ancestral territories, disrupting their lives and the lives of other living creatures there for the short-term gain of a few corporate heads and the Canadian government. The camp is seeking bodies to help them resist and has a list of supplies and ways to support them at their website, Unistoten Camp. Unistoten.camp. U-N-I-S-T-O-T-E-N dot camp. There you can also find lots of material about their struggle. There are also many videos about the camp up at sub.media. We hope to have folks from the camp on in the future to speak about the work that they're doing to heal their people and the land, and we wish them the best of luck in the struggle. So I'm joined right now by Cindy Milstein, uh, which I'm very happy about. Uh, Cindy is the author of multiple books and articles and is the editor of a compilation called Rebellious Morning, available through AK Press, which... I mean, you'd do better to talk about it than me, but it, it's um, it's quite an impressive collection, and also of the collection Taking Size, which some of the listeners may be more familiar with. It's been out for a number of years, and that in its prior version, um, Accomplices and Allies. Is it? Well, no, that was a zine called Revolutionary Solidarity oh, okay. that turned into Taking Sides, which has a subtitle Revolutionary Solidarity and the Poverty of Liberalism. I think it's, boy, I think that's only been out... Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe two years, three years. <laughs> oh, really? It's Only pretty, that one? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Accomplices Not Allies is an essay that's in that yeah, collection, Yeah, it, right? it's an essay that got turned into a zine that's probably been downloaded and handed out um, in many, many places, probably 10, 30, 40,000 times. That zine is yeah. very, very popular. And yeah. that was the beginning of it. It's me really... handing out that zine on the street, and I'm like, wow, this actually changes people's <laughs> minds, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> so I, which I was really struck by, which led to a zine compilation during the Ferguson Uprising Solidarity demos. That led to that anthology, which is other pieces added to it. Did you have much like follow-up where people would come back and be like, I read that essay, like, let's talk about this sort of thing? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I I mean, I was, I always am in moments of uh, demonstrations or or protest moments or when there's like lots of people, tens of thousands of people in the street trying to shut down freeways. <laughs> I'm also like, these are great moments to bring a ton of zines and hand them out because I'm always like, and meet people. Those are my two things. I'm yeah. like, I don't want to... Ju- why just stand around holding a banner? I can, which I like doing too. Mm. Make, but how do we build social relations and talk to people? So I always use those moments. I think they're just these really incredible moments where we can actually meet each other and talk. And and uh, so yeah. But anyway, I started handing out that zine because there was I was living in the Bay Area and there was gigantic outburst of people doing solidarity demos, shutting down bridges and freeways and ev- everything. And the police couldn't really contain us. And it was really really powerful. Some young high college students who had never been political before poured out and shut down an ongoing Amtrak train, which a bunch of us were like, dude, you won't work, but it <laughs> oh did. God, it was intense. So it was actually very powerful. But no, but then people just, it was this flip where people started policing each other, but it almost happened like in, in the blink of an eye. The people that had more of a systemic critique were like, wow, we can keep going and, you know, actually really start thinking about upping the ante of, of social contestation and also bring a different vision. 
and it just almost overnight, like thousands of people started and it's not their bad people. Mm-hmm. But I think people new to politics that don't have a systemic critique were <laughs> you can't do that. Yeah, but <laughs> right in front of Riot Cop when we were out there pro it really kept getting me and we're here we people are out there like police are killing people and then they would be pointing out people to police that were the people the police had mm-hmm. been and so I, I, I went and started and printing thousands of copies of a couple of not alleys and me and a couple of friends were on the streets just handing them out to me. But it was really interesting because two or three nights later, because it was going on for nights, mm-hmm. is a lot of people came up to me and would go, Wow, I read that zine. I really feel awkward about what I did the other night or feel embarrassed or I had hadn't thought through the implications and, and I had which I don't like doing because I don't think it often changes people's minds, but I'd been losing my temper a lot um, with those people mm-hmm. because people were at risk. That's when I lose my temper. I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, I don't have much much time to act right now. They're pointing someone out to the police or handing them over to them. That's why I was like, wow, and <laughs> put together a few more pieces and then printed a bunch of those and handed them out. And, and that's for taking sides. I was, And you see that same dynamic in a, every time there's an upsurge. Mm-hmm. A lot of people instantly throw themselves into something. I've been, it's really interesting. There's like a... Humans are such a funny creature because we learn by imitating each other, and peer pressure is really powerful, and and when a lot and cultural norms. And so mm-hmm. when people start thinking the norm is everyone in the street and shutting down a bridge, everyone will do it, in in ways that are jo- jo- joyful and beautiful and often consensual. And then you know a few days later, people go, "Wow, this isn't really my pal," you know, or that or just they'll kind of get. Sh- I don't know what it is. It's an interesting. They'll just thing. like go out and try it, and then just be like thinking through a couple of days later, and like, well, right, that wasn't the way that I wanted to yeah. engage. Yeah, or they have, or they're new to politics, and they got caught up in, and then they're like, huh, well, but I've had good interactions with police before. Maybe I don't understand who these other people are saying that they hate all the police, and mm-hmm. so. But I think that's to me. A friend of mine said this during Occupy. It really stuck with me. It's like these moments when tens of thousands or a hundred people pour in the street, and they there's these gigantic openings that open up overnight, and we only are are as as anarchists or other people who think in terms of a self organized, autonomous, self determined society. We are our task is to keep those spaces open as long as possible, and during that, create as many relationships mm-hmm. and help each other transform ourselves more than we can and learn how to better practice these things because we know they're going to shut down again. And I that so I thought that was so, because most people think, oh, they're never going to shut down. Oh, this is beautiful. We're in the moment of revolution. But ever since then, I think that's why I'm really like, oh, these are moments where we have the capacity to build trust and relationships that could outlive those moments so we can then talk to each other and mm-hmm. grow and learn. And so that's why I'm always like, oh, this is a good chance to spend the entire night printing off 10,000 zines and handing them out on the street. It's like prepping for a jailbreak. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. So that always kind of, that motivated that that book. But I mean, I also feel like I, w- taking sides, I I have this deal with AK, which I really appreciate is I, I, I don't take royalties for books. I want a bigger discount or want like a more a few more free books at the beginning so I can also um, and give them out. Or, and with taking sides especially, there was a bunch of moments that popped up again out of other situations where police murdered people, and one was in Minneapolis where folks um, circled outside a police station for about a week or two, mm. and some folks there were like, wow, it would be really cool if we could get some taking sides, so I just asked some folks to donate money, and I bought a whole bunch of the books um, and mailed them there into four or five other cities where similar things were going on, and it was like the Minneapolis people were like, we're sitting outside this police station in the middle of this direct action, and we're starting to have those debates where some people are like, we shouldn't be interrupting the police's work. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so they said they, a lot of them sat down and were doing reading essays together and having conversations in the middle of it, which is exactly why like, I'm like, oh, great, that's what I want mm-hmm. to be this to be used for. It doesn't have answers, but open up space for people to have conversations and hopefully keep the spaces open longer and have more people understand that pol- police as an institution is a form of systemic violence itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and not just in the moments where, like, the television happens to grab on to like one person who gets killed by the police who's unarmed or having a mental health crisis or whatever this sitting in their own home yeah. or whatever. <laughs> yeah yeah but no that that's when I felt the most I was like oh this is exactly why I do books you know mm-hmm. I was like I don't know what I I don't know what if that changed anything that much or kept that space open longer or changed minds but I I suspect probably it, it did a few and it just also like oh this is exactly why I do this so that it can be part of it's yet another, I mean, I really like the Zapatista phrase, um, that words are weapons. It's it's yet another weapon in our our arsenal of dismantling the structures <laughs> that we don't like. So. And another cool element of it is because, like, it's like, I, I love mixtapes. Uh-huh. 
um, I don't perform any music myself, but I like. I don't know. I think it's a really charming way to share with other people a playlist of music that yeah. like you really like and you put together in a yeah. certain order. And it's almost like I mean, this is like showing my age or whatever but people don't listen to albums all the way through uh -huh. anymore, i think because uh -huh. especially as it goes more and more digital and people are able to like skip tracks like when it was tapes when it was albums it was a little more difficult to do that yeah i thought about that but yeah. now that it's people listening online you're listening to whatever like hot track is coming up and if you're a really big fan then you'll go and listen for the deep digs uh -huh. but these these books rebellious morning and taking sides are both kind of examples of like a mixtape that you've compiled and coordinated and so the content you could you could take a copy of one of those books and you could just read one of the essays by themselves or yeah. you could see how it maybe fits with the one before after or trouble that relationship with the next essay and it's, yeah it's really cool especially for discussion i think yeah i thought about that i mean taking sides was different because i threw it together absurdly fast i mean it was also you know i wasn't sleep i was staying up there were demonstrations from 4 p.m. to usually would go till one or two in the morning for a couple weeks and i was there at 4 p.m. and yeah. stayed till the night and then didn't wasn't sleeping and threw it together and but and that was all previously pretty printed pieces so then when I was asked AKO oh, can I turn this into a book added I think double the number of essays but I always encourage people to actually read them all because it was originally going to be titled side by side because mm -hmm. um, like the whole premise to me is like why don't we maintain solidarity even if we don't agree with each other's strategy is like we don't need to be the ones turning each other in to, to structural violence we need to figure out ways to you know allow to me diversity of tactics it should be also diversity of political beliefs and diversity of strategies and because none of us know the answer to transforming this world or we would be there already and um it, and it's a process so how do we do that so i also but then right before it went to press one of the editors at ak i'm so grateful for because we kept going side by side like that's what the idea is why can't we stay side by side even in our differences and then he's like there's something that's we kept going there's something wrong with that title and at the very, almost before it went to press, one of them said, but first you have to take a side before you can be side by side. We're not side by side with police. We're not side by mm -hmm. side with fascists. So I really like that the title switched. But it is a mixed tape, and I like that people can read individual. And then to me, they're also debating, like none of the pieces mm -hmm. actually quite agree with each other because none of us also know how to do so side by side solidarity well. I, I was really struck. Last, last week I've been touring a lot with Rebellious Morning and I try always to create as much space to have co people share and have conversation as I am talking and um, someone the other day who had been a partner of someone who was a J20 defendant and ha they have children and we were just talking in that space about you know how intense it was and I did a huge amount of J20 solidarity work and support work and was really committed to that for the entirety of the time and it wasn't criticism of me but um, I was really struck by this person was like saying, you know, the charges were dropped and but how much, you know, sort of pain and sorrow was left over from thinking my partner might have gone to prison for 75 years. We have kids. We have, you know, the ramifications are were really heavy for them in a lot of ways. And this person was like, well, a huge loss I still feel is why didn't anyone think to support the families or the friends of those who were going to be? And sometimes we did, but by and large, that wasn't a big category. And I thought, oh, this is what's beautiful when we open up space for people to say, oh, okay, you know, people were side by side with a lot of people through the J20. And in a way, I'm really proud of that. A lot of a lot of people did a lot, and we could have done better. And then so then that was one of the could have done betters to me, you know. And um, and next time, hopefully, we can. So none of us know the answer to how we stay side by side, but we took a side against state repression. So that really struck me. But rebellious morning was really different because. I actually start, was working on it before taking sides, and I think it sort of started. It started as me blogging a lot when I was going through taking care of my parents, getting sick and dying, and then dying well, and also losing, fighting eviction, and fighting gentrification, and fighting police murdering. So a lot of different losses I was fighting, and I was blogging a lot about it, and writing. Now I barely ever remember to get to my blog. I'm always just doing Instagram instead, which seems a, a loss. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I and then I, a lot of people were. were following that when I was writing about loss and were I was really struck by their like oh I, I had more response to that than anything I've ever written and and not that that's why I did a book because I'm like oh wow people are responding but that it, the beauty of how people were responding really touched me as everyone's like wow this happened to me and no one I didn't have a voice for it and I didn't have anyone also the support is so thin in our communities and and a lot of people kept remarking 
you weren't just speaking about yourself. There was something so deeply human in the way you're writing. And I was like, ah, I was really perplexed by what is that in my writing? And so when this rebellious side turned into the anthology, I, it was less a mixtape than like deep, deep curation and social relationships. Mm -hmm. I mean, I spent a long time with the people like who would write for it and who could write for it and he, long, long conversations and a lot of back and forth. And But like, whose writing wasn't a uh, me, 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 <laughs> but here's something that happened that I want to exude empathy about and that you can see yourself in. Mm -hmm. And it is, there's a lot, there are actually, there's so many writings about grief and loss, and but, but and then some are, a lot of them are mainstream or through, you know, the lens of religion or all, but then there are a lot of radicals writing about their own loss and zines and things like that, but they often just, you get a sense, you know, a lot of us, I don't know, we live in a culture that's a very individualist culture. Mm -hmm. It's not a criticism, but I was really struck by really trying to be like, what are the things you look for in pieces that we all can see ourselves in those pieces, which is what I really wanted to get. How do you curate empathy? How do you teach people empathy as a practice that we don't even know how to do? And I really kind of wanted that underlying as sort of a thing that wasn't explicit, but mm -hmm. implicit, I hope. And so I feel really proud of this specific book because I feel like it. it's in the same way I'm really admire people that do translation because I can't do that. It's like an art. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a like a skill <laughs> or what I, I guess in this book I feel like was more practice of art and social relationships than it wasn't which mixtapes are too like but yeah and a lot of you know heavily editing pieces and shaping pieces with people mm -hmm. as opposed to taking sides where reprints and I edited them and asked people to change things but it was more like okay you know we weren't thinking through okay what's the voice in this or how what's the shape of it going to look like which mm -hmm. yeah so but you can rebellious morning more than taking sides actually you can just pick up and read a piece there's no order they're not debating each other mm -hmm. <laughs> i feel like they all have a quality where i think you come away with i hope and i've heard people say you come away with like wow there's something so deeply beautiful and human and empathetic about these but also it seems like grief as a concept um needs to be in order to be human it has to make space for different people's different approaches and different personalized experiences and that sharing creates the the collaborative and collective like learning opportunity for everyone else or or release or yeah. growth or breaking or whatever yeah yeah although i mean i've spoken about this on other uh, two other podcasts um a lot so i i first wanted to thank thank all podcasts for being out there that are radical because i'm really struck by how important they are at this moment. A lot, a lot of people are listening to uh, podcasts that are challenging um, dominant norms of thinking and asking people to think critically and, and act with a social vision. But uh, This Is Hell and uh, Soulcast both talked to me about this book. So if people want to have more like, you know, what I generally speak about in terms of when I try to sh frame this book in ways that aren't actually in the book. <laughs> um, I'm all about people thinking for themselves. So I tend not to write introductions that tell you how to think about a book as mm -hmm. assume that people are capable of interpreting it for themselves. But um, in hindsight, um, um, I, for me, in thinking about it, um, I also think there's m most gr a lot of grief books actually do try to homogenize how people talk about grief or think about grief. And they're deeply structured by forms of thinking in the society like commodification or, you know, s charity models or colonialist ways of thinking and so this book is also implicitly but and I think it comes through explicitly in a lot of pieces is is challenging you know the dominant the dominant norms of colonialism and capitalism and individualism and and asking us to think about how would we self-determine and self-organize ourselves around all sorts of losses that don't and we actually don't need to have the ways we do them look the same actually people used and many places still do have like a myriad of incredible and rich and deep ways of facing and grappling with losses and, and becoming more human to with the, and through them. Um, and so, but I, a lot of grief, a lot of grief things actually, I think, try to do that. So in a way, when you ask that, I'm thinking, oh, what I appreciate about this too is in a sense, the pieces to some degree, they're not troubling each other, but they're, they're troubling the notion that loss has to be just a death or, or, you know, that for me, loss is anything that one feels as a terrible loss that debilitates one and makes one feel 
you know, a, an enormous gap or absence and as if there's a break in one's, a rupture, as I heard someone say the other day about large-scale um, ecological catastrophes, there's a rupture in society that we all recognize <laughs> as a moment that collectively we all feel. I don't know, why, do, why does that have to be the same law? So in a way, this book is troubling. A lot of ways we think about it, even if the pieces aren't like trying to argue Against argue a position. Other, yeah. yeah, which is actually what the opposite of what I'm arguing is why do we have to come up with one narrow view of what loss and grief is and determine one right way? That's actually what's been wrong with, to me, how we, how we think about it. But I mean, and there's oh, so many ways it didn't get covered in, in this anthology, so I hope it's like an enticement for people to be like, and I mean, I've done, I think I've, this year I've been really focusing that because I really feel honored by doing death doula work when I've done it, or I do. I try really hard to to be there more for people that are going through loss that are that I'm close to, and or or times when social social movements or projects are going through pain, and uh, I'm just really committed to doing that as part of my um, political work, and I really wanted to focus in on that. And this year I'm like I've gotten away from that because I decided to. Uh, do a lot of go around and do a lot of conversations with this book but then I'm like oh I, I really feel like this is part of that I mean opening up space for that so and I hadn't really struck me till till fairly till fa fairly recently but I feel really really honored I have gone to probably done this place 60 places and so many different situations oftentimes right after some really horrific thing has happened that has touched a lot of people in that community who have chosen to come you know in cities where the opiate crisis is like the AIDS crisis and after a hurricane has devastated an area or someone's been deported or um, a community member that everyone knows in social circles has died or, or, or killed themselves or been murdered by police. And, but I've just come up against so many other forms of losses that I hadn't thought about, which to me, the more I do this, the more I'm, I'm just like, there's so, you know, there's so many things that are making people feel that they need to be able to more and, and I none of us could completely we shouldn't come up with a laundry list you know mm -hmm. we shouldn't um, and so yeah I guess that's the troubling of it like how do we think how do we think about what it is and how to do it and what's what's considered loss yeah. I really appreciate the like the reflection between I mean as you as you stated this is a more curated like preened book where well, not preened that's a weird word, oh, no. but like <laughs> where like <laughs> people have contributed and there's been a collaboration between yourself and them yeah. about like what voices are being expressed and like how it, how it fits. And, but the fact that you're using touring around this, you'll, can I, can I say like what the presentation last night, for instance, at Firestorm was like, sort of? Oh yeah, sure. Cause you were there. You, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, just having like an introduction and like some of the ideas that you're you're trying to bring up and sort of like giving some potential topics or some just trying to like poke people to get interested in thinking about or not interested th we think about it anyway but giving people some other prompts for ways of approaching or the way that you are attending at this point through your experience to approach loss in its myriad forms and then allowing some space for people to just sort of like bubble with that for a minute and then come back and have a discussion like mostly when people tour with books my experience is that's not the format the format is more like question and answer and there can be some debate and discussion and discourse but forming a circle afterwards um it's prefigurative to like kind of maybe what you're hoping it seems people will get out of the book in the first place which i think is really is really helpful and almost like ministerial sort of okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i mean i don't know I, I really do feel like it's how how do we together figure out how to, how to hold brave space while we're we're striving to change the world. Like we have to do that all the time. This isn't something. I mean, one of the one of the key for me political interventions of this book is like we need to be doing this all. That this isn't some special thing that we do only when we think there's some monumental rupture. But I mean, every one I've done of this when. I, the first four or five, I actually just would talk, and I'm a pretty fast, fast moving. My brain moves fast. I talk fast, you know, and I would like put out a lot of. Inf I don't do this like here's the one two points I want you to take. I always put out too many points for people to think about. But uh, the first four or five, I just then said, okay, so let's start sharing stories, and people, uh, people actually no, we're look yeah either. I mean, a lot of people had tears or look like clearly like they needed a break, mm -hmm. but then people were like. 
could we breathe? Like people, the first few <laughs> people said, could we breathe for a few minutes deeply together? And I was like, why don't we take, and after the first, I'm like, oh no, hey, why don't we just take a break? So, so now I've been doing that for mm -hmm. 10 or 15 or 20 minutes, or sometimes I have like trying to just see when people seem like they're ready and not asking everyone to come back, asking only the people that want to come back. And people self-select, sometimes everyone does, sometimes, you know, um, um, you know I, I was uh, had a really lovely, incredible experience this summer of going to Sweden and Finland for three weeks because someone had read this book and mm. wanted me to come there and um, figure out a way to get airfare, which was great for me. <laughs> and uh, and there was two anarchist book fairs, and, but I just oh, I felt so honored to do that too. I just learned I learned so much, including that culturally people have a hard time. Um, they are more than other, I mean, different regions have very different cultural ways of how they speak, right, anywhere. But mm -hmm. it was very unique to me in Sweden, how people, and I was really struck by it. I was like, wow, I'm, I must be doing a bad a bad job of holding brave space because I would do the, you know, do the talk and then like, I don't know, let's say, let's say 50 people were at the talk and four would come back to talk. And then after people went, oh, people have such a hard time in groups talking here. But then a lot of people came up to me individually later because mm -hmm. I was, I, I didn't go to that many places. I was in cities for like four or five days and had a lot of time to talk to people about that and other things. So it's just really struck culturally. It was just, but people were like, oh, you don't know how important this is because for us, it's really hard for us to even think about sharing other hard topics. And it's, sharing hard topics together is hard for them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so, so this, I'll say is I just think we're really bad at figuring out ways to hold space for brave conversations about anything that's hard <laughs> here in general, right? Like. Mm -hmm difficult conversations about in this moment where a lot of people are explaining that their bodies have been experiencing forms of sexual assault or rape or non-consensual abuse and you know I keep going you know okay it's clear to me I that's clear that a lot of people's bodies experience that but like how would we actually get to the point where we could hold space to talk about like who's doing that and why and have those people talk about it in ways where someone's not the sexual assaulter but someone who is sexually assaulted and mm -hmm. needs to with everybody else grieve that they became that person and um, somehow I don't know what this would look like you know I, like how do we how do we figure out ways to take responsibility and talk about it in ways and talk about how we're, we're all damaged but then people have the capacity I hope as humans to be flexible enough and imaginative enough to want to be a different person and I don't know what that would look like but how do we hold I'm really intrigued mm -hmm. by how do we hold these spaces where we really do start transforming. I mean, I watch people who are liberals and think the state and capitalism are the best things ever, you know, but they want, and then they end up being around people who don't think that way. And I watch when they themselves just listen and learn and ask questions and think through their own kind of contradictions and they themselves, people shift. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I shift, well, we all shift, hopefully, if we're gonna grow. So how would we do that? But yeah, no, I don't know, I've, I've, I've really, tried really hard I'm all about trying to prefigure every like mm -hmm. when, everything we do we have to prefigure instead of waiting to be the people we want to be just for some other world and it's okay to make mistakes oh the way yeah that, right yeah it's no pretty natural yeah and I feel, I feel like I feel like a part of again the impulse for this book is I just was I've been so pained both that an anarchists and the world of anarchism has let me and so many other people down not just me when we have the hardest moments of our lives or when bad things happen within our circles, because there are power dynamics within anarchism, there are you know social capital. Certain people have there's also all the things that we don't like in the rest of the world. We're part of that world, right? Mm -hmm. And we're really bad. Instead, there's this like ridiculous sort of call out culture. Someone does one thing wrong, and you never talk to them again, or you kick them out of your community. It, it's almost like we replicate the same structures of like solitary confinement, or you know hyper policing of each other and I, I just think we ha you know I know a lot of other people are thinking about this now which is good but um I think we've gotten to the point where people are so scared of saying anything because they're like if I say the one thing wrong if I use the wrong pronoun that's it I'm out of you know a space and I'm like oh we make mistakes I yeah I know what I, I'm just, I so bad at remembering how to pronounce people's names a lot of times and then I'm like I barely remember how to pronounce mine and then I'm like okay I would have lost so many people right now if that was a criteria you know and I don't know so I was I'm part of this anarchist summer school called the Institute for Advanced Troublemaking in Worcester Mass and it's eight days for uh, adults from 16 to 80 or whatever and uh, um and we this last summer was only the second year and um the first year felt really good but it was we felt like oh 
it still was too experimental. Let's make keep it sort of similar, but really hone in and really focus on intentionality about all the things we didn't think went well. And me personally doing a lot of these talks all year, I was like, oh, more than ever, I've been really intrigued by how when you do hold brave space around thing that is about deep, everybody walks in the room that stays for these spaces. I can just, you know, has is there because they're feeling deeply about not feeling cared for or mm -hmm. feeling the pain of their losses or bringing up moments that they feel like they wish they could have grieved in different ways or taken charge of or understood it was even a grief and a loss. And so I was like, oh, I really want to do this in this space in a way. In, in how do we do that? And I was, and so we tried this experiment there that was like instead of, at the beginning, instead of a community agreement, um, the very first thing we got there and we circled up with, we always take about 25 people and there's about 12 or 15 other people that are like facilitators or part of it, but we all just kind of, it's like a one room schoolhouse. It mm -hmm. was almost impossible to tell who was, who was, who was who at the end of, in terms of, but we were like, okay, we're not gonna have community agreements because we're not a community. We just got here. We don't, a lot of us don't know each other. You're not agreeing to anything when we do community agreements and most of them are just things don't to not do. Mm -hmm. and, it was, and so we're like, we're gonna try really hard to co-create a, a culture of care and co-learning. And here's some guy, thoughts that we had about how we might do that, but none of us know. And that's why it has to be us. It's a process of us doing that together. So one of them was like, let's all try really hard to keep an open heart and an open mind. Um, let's all try really hard to learn and grow. You know? mm -hmm. And But I or I don't even remember play seriously. I think that one, but which we did. <laughs> um, but the one I liked best was why not? Why? How about for the next eight days, we all try to be the people we want to be in the world we want. And when we did the non-closure circle at the end, because I, like Rebellious Morning, I, I asked everybody not to have closure because mm -hmm. there's no closure to our lives and all the things we experience. And and when you do it, this anarchist summer school was so absurdly transformative and everyone for the whole time, I've never experience myself too. I mean, the number of times I was crying harder and laughing harder and feeling that everyone was transformed. I think almost everyone, I, just reading the evaluations and talking to people and because we really did do that. And then I read through at the very end during the circle, like all the, thing, the things we had said, oh, here's some guidelines. And, and then I really started crying because I was like, wow, people not only did that, but they did it so much better and in so many ways than I thought people could. Mm. And I'm just really struck by like, why don't, this is the only life we have, the only world mm. we have, the only time we'll be doing, you know, like we're here to struggle together and to care together and to, like I really more and more like prefiguration, you know, I don't know, there's been critiques of prefiguration from a different, you know, fine, I'm always happy when anarchists have really thoughtful critiques. Yuri Gordon has written a long thoughtful critique about thinking prefiguration is only sort of like coming through a religious framework and other other critiques of it like it's sort of like we're waiting to prefigure to some other better world mm -hmm. that's not actually in the here and now and I, that is not how i understand it you know and um and crime think is critiqued it for like you know oh we don't want to pre we just i don't i don't quite even understand the prefigure <laughs> the, the critique more like do your own thing and don't sort of think about how that impacts other which which is a caricature but also i i think kind of gets to the core of autonomy without a sense of you know ah oh, we don't need to we don't need self we don't need direct democracy, self-governance, because if everyone does everything, it'll work out. And I'm like, it, it doesn't. We need spaces to have conversations about mm -hmm. and figure out things together. And and so, but I'm more and more like deeply like, prefiguration isn't just about like, how do we organize a demonstration or how do we set up an info shop? It's, it's actually to me, I really, really believe deeply prefiguration is us in the here and now, every moment we can think of intentionally co together, co-creating new forms of social relationships and new forms of social organization and that we continually reflect on how we could do those in different ways and better and actually actually really try to make mistakes like let the mistakes happen not try make mistakes mm -hmm. but as someone said to me earlier when I was trying let's make better mistakes so I just want to make better <laughs> mistakes you know but if we do that we can mm -hmm. you know like I'm, and so I really do feel proud of the San Francisco Summer School in ways I don't feel proud of other things I do sometimes where like the first year we, we threw an experiment together we're really committed to People need spaces to reflect and grow together and think through ideas and, you know, step, like, not pause, but, like, take enough time to really start thinking through a directionality to be there for their politics. And then 
we didn't have enough time to do it. And we were like, okay, it's an experiment. We know the things that are not quite together, but we're going to do it. And, and almost everybody the first year said, I've never, ever been in a space. Like I've, everyone's felt intellectually and politically challenged, but every single person that went the first year said, I've never, ever been in a space that, and then they would add, and this was just personally to me. It wasn't even, I was so struck by everyone almost used the same language. And someone said, for instance, I've never, ever been in a space where I, I felt like I wasn't going to be raped because mm -hmm. they'd had a lot of trauma. And I was like, or I've never, ever been in a space where anarchists weren't toxic. Or I've, and I was like, that just pains me because I don't want anarchism. Mm -hmm. you know. And then they were like, how can I go back to the world? And I was like, well, go find those anarchists that aren't toxic and try, you know, find those people that, that don't hurt your body and try, you know, try again. And I don't have the, you know, but, but so then the next year we're like, okay, wow, everyone kept saying they'd never, ever been in this space. Well, let's try to try harder to make that space here. And I really tried hard in my little section. I had a three-part little thing called Try Anarchism for Life, which is my new thing as a double, as I like puns. <laughs> and so, um, which I hated growing up because my dad told puns all the time. <laughs> now, now that he's dead, I'm like, oh, fondly. Oh, but, uh, my parents, uh. <laughs> rolled my eyes all the time. My cousin was just reminding me of how much I hated him telling puns. Um, but, but like, like I'm, I want people, once they decide to be an anarchist, to do it for the whole of their life. Like, I, every year goes by, and I'm like, why am I always still around? So many 18 to 25-year-old anarchists, where do the ones go? They turn it, where is the island? Where do they all go? <laughs> and uh, there are ones, but it's like there are a profound drop-off. And, and that's all our faults, because we don't have multi-generation. We don't have structures for care and infrastructure that holds us for the whole of our life. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm more and more focusing on care. Um, but, but also try anarchists from, to make life. Like, isn't that what anarchism is about? Like, the creation of lives worth living and for everybody and, and good deaths and good ways of handling loss and, and, and also try, like experiment. All, we don't know how to do this. So we're going to have mm -hmm. to keep trying. And so I, I was saying that during the anarchist um, summer. And at the end, people were, we did this at one point. It was tw almost toward the end. And I was like, this space feels absurd. Like, we were all like, this space feels absurd. We are co-creating this space. Space that feels incredible. Like, and we were all like starting to anticipate, oh, we're have going to have to, as everyone kept saying, step back into the real world. And I'm like, but this is, we made this. This is the real world. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, it, it is. Like, we're stepping back into the not real, horrible world that we don't want to live in. So I really was so neat. I opened up space instead of what I was going to talk about. And we did this thing. I was like, okay, could each people describe what, we, what you think happened intentionally to allow this to be a different type of world? And it, just look at the little micro things and then look at the history of how that micro thing happened. Mm -hmm. And it was such a neat exercise. I don't know. I was like really enjoyed listening to people talk about, because these things don't happen accidentally. Well, like give an example. Like Okay. Um, like that community agreements thing. Okay. I okay. was like, I've been to hundreds of things over the past five or six years where those community agreements get put up. And I've had this just uncomfort with them the whole time. And each time I'm like, what is it about them? I feel like they're all like, don't talk or, you know, let... Only, only, you know, one mic, one. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. But there's some people I really want to hear talk. They start talking, then people cut them off. And I'm like, but they're actually saying something. Or some people don't want to talk. And I can see that they're feeling like almost, you know, mm -hmm. it's just sort of like, no, they're not all don't do this. Or I'm just feeling like, but we don't know each other. And suddenly people are kind of encouraging people to, it's almost we skip over. I don't, I kept going, what is it about this that bothers me? You know? And so then it, and, and we did this thing on the application for the Anarchist Summer School saying, what do you need for an environment to feel brave brave or safer? I don't, because I don't think we can promise safety. And a lot of people in, before they came to the summer school said, oh, I need, a, I need the community agreements. And I was like, and so we, as organizers, kind of had a debate. And I'm like, I want to try something. I just, can we just try this, you know? And I don't know. So me, I was like, okay, how did we get to this point for me in that where we were going to try something different? And for me, I felt like it really worked. But other people said, for instance, I, it was in a barn at a 25-year-old collective space that's in Worcester, Mass, that people had been had a free school in. And mm. part of that, we went to this really cool thing where kids um, that went through that free school now do this program called SCAMP, where they do these wild games in a park that are kind of dangerous with a whole bunch of little kids after the park's supposed to close. So they basically are just taking over. It says, do not be in the park, but they are. And like this it. is really subtle, lovely thing. And they play these highly dangerous games that, and they have a big zine full of the rules and they have really funny names and they have risk factor. Most of them are dangerous, but, but they're super fun and collective and people learn how to be kind of playful and tough. But these little kids will come up to you and go, 
you know, I can be, I can learn how to be tough, but I know if anyone touches me in a way I don't want to, we can stop. Or if someone is getting hurt, we stop and we take care of each other. So it's, it's mm-hmm. this really subversive. I, the, I'm, I'm really intrigued by how games teach us how to, like almost better than the, all the workshops we put on. So, so anyway, we brought the people this year to that and an anarchist marching band came first and there was like 200 people in the park the anarchist marching band some of us it was a friday some of us did a circled up and had a a non-religious um um jewish candle lighting candle and we actually did a prayer of morning but just as we were about to do that because some people were having lost the band started playing and then we we're all like let's just dance and everyone's <laughs> laughing and we all 200 people were dancing and then these kids were doing these games and it was so incredible and so one of people said, oh, I felt that was the best mo- one of the best moments of camp because we were pl- all playing together and dancing and crying. Like we got together around this, the, the anarchist Jews created the space for us to think about mourning and loss, but we were all laughing at the same time and dancing and crying and, and learning and playing. And like that made me realize there's so many different ways. And if the police had come, they never would have been able to take over the park. And they were said that just felt that moment just made me rethink everything I do politically. And I was and I was like, well, where did that moment come from? That little moment in that park. Because mm-hmm. they and they and they said, Oh yeah, there's this anarchist space that's been around for twenty five years that ten years ago decided to do a free school for six years ago. And the kids that went through that free school when they were twelve, ten and twelve and fourteen are now doing this thing called SCAMP as eighteen and nineteen year olds that are mentoring another generation and they are part of this community. And those people that do the SCAMP school all are, some of them were at the anarchist summer school too, and they're like, I, I was born in Worcester, and I've just I've decided I will die in Worcester. I'm going to be here my whole life because I understand that there's this fabric of social relationships that people are trying to create here. And so I'm like, this one moment of fun in the park mm-hmm. has a that history of thoughtfulness yeah. of anarchists going. We need to buy houses and focus on social relation infrastructure, which they do in Worcester. We need to mentor other people. We need to try to create, and then let those people do other things, mm-hmm. and. You know, it isn't at these moments, that's maybe an example, you know, but I think a lot of the things we do are so, we think they're ephemeral, we think they don't have a history, we mm-hmm. think, wow, I had a really great, so the thing I do with Rebellious Morning where I stop, take a break, and come back together, I was just at the Atlanta Radical Book Fair, which I, was lovely and wonderful, and I love the idea of radical because it brings in lots more people than just mm-hmm. kind of like one particular way of thinking, but I was asked to do a, a little panel there with um, someone else, and it was so collaborative and beautiful, and we decided to call it taking care of ourselves. It was supposed to be about thinking through transformative anti-prison and anti-police work. And we both like, let's focus on how people try to, um, how do we form different relationships while we're trying to get rid of structures that don't care for us? How do we form relationships of care at the same time? Because mm-hmm. both of us have a similar perspective. Abolition requires us bringing in what we want instead. And at the, we were talking about a Q and A because it was in this auditorium. It was so collaborative. Like, I never do PowerPoints. The person's like, well, let's do a PowerPoint and have these images and we can bounce back off each other. And I was like, okay. It was so lovely. It was such a lovely collaboration. But then at one point, it's like, could we not do a QA? and a Because I've been doing these things where we just open up space and we're in this auditorium and both of us thought this might not work. But we did. We were like, don't ask us questions. We asked the house lights to come up in the auditorium. And I'd been in a couple of their panels and it was very Q&A and felt very, you know, it was beautiful, actually. I love the panels, but... But the minute we stopped, it's like, and we both were like, decided, we talked about it and we said, you know, we could just give talks, but we both feel really emotional about this topic. So we both, our voice is broken. Mm -hmm. We both were tearing up while we were talking. We both said like, this is an emotional subject. We do this work because prisons and police hurt us and kill us. And we, you know, we're not doing it for some random reason, all of us. And the first person that spoke, every, you know, every single person spoke from their heart it was so these personal beautiful stories you know about how police and prisons had had hurt their lives but people also talked about examples of how they had self-determined and taken you know like someone with mental health for instance they said okay i've seen a lot of my friends taken by police and been treated really badly or imprisoned or murdered because of mental health because police kill people Mm -hmm. with mental health challenges a lot and they said so i have written up a lot of the ways when i have my you know of how i want to have that done differently so that police aren't called and so that I'm not carted off to a mental hospital, which looks like a a prison sometimes or all these other things. People told the most beautiful stories, but almost everybody, there were people tearing up and crying while they were telling stories. And afterwards, so many people came up to us and said, that was so touching. I've never been to a panel where we talked about police and prisons, where we've talked about how we feel about it too, and where we got to share stories about it. I'm like, there's nothing magic about it. And at the end, I was like, this is what people should do as part of their political work, like actually have assemblies mm-hmm. 
where people talk about we're doing this work for a reason or you know so i don't know how how can we incorporate these things you know and not think it's this episodic thing where we have a demo against the new prisons being built it's it's episodic and it disappears but it's us over the long term building structures of care that actually will mean over time we won't we'll have less and less need for police in certain parts of our life mm -hmm. and the average person who's not thinks like us or i don't even know what the average person that's a stupid phrase yeah. I, it's a silly phrase the people that don't think about police in terms of structural will will know that they it won't just be you won't be raised to think oh you know when when my cat gets stuck up a tree i should call the cops when my child has a you know a, a mental health break for the first time and i'm scared because i don't even understand what it is i won't think to call the cops you know all these things that people do because they don't know what else to do um they'll think of other structures so it's interesting like using that space as a prefigurative like experimentation room sort of that people could potentially like any of these discussions where it's been opened up to be collaborative among the people that are participating and hopefully inspiring these conversations to be taken back with them one one of the points of the discussion last night that strikes me at this moment is uh, a discussion of um and pointing back to why there aren't people of multiple generations, especially in uh, aging, who are still active in anarchist, in anarchist, anarchist milieus, is that it's so hard surviving anyway in the capitalist system yep. to grow older, and our social nets are so fractured and tattered that most of us don't have that multi generationality in our family group, let alone in our milieus. Maybe through churches or like faith groups. Yeah but it's mostly through workplaces, which also substitutes the sociality of, of these community get-togethers of potlucks, like we have work work meetings and work dinners and what have you, um, based around the fact that we need to get a job done in order to pay for bills and what have you. Yeah. Uh, but so I'm interested in, in hearing what you have to say about um, about appro like anarchist approaches towards... Um, towards that period of like poor health and also at times towards death and through death um like anarchist approaches towards that stuff and what you've heard and, or what ideas you have about like how we could do better yeah. at that I, yeah i'm more and more doing this i mean i've been feeling like also again honored that i feel like i've i've learned so much yeah i think i think learning is unidirectional so i feel like i've learned so much by being around hundreds and hundreds of people this year and including of all ages and i've gone to a lot of other things in between also doing this um the, these kind of talks but i'm i'm really struck first of all when i'm all of us when we are in spaces that are multi-generational it's not just that anarchism doesn't isn't have care infrastructure for the things we face as we age but it it's this has gone on for a long time it does not have by and large solid infrastructure for when people um, decide to have children or mm -hmm. uh, or when once the ch once the children are there or other when people are out of work or when people have lost their housing or so for the most parts of our lives it there are things we do well with the infrastructure and often maybe that's one reason why like again I don't think any I, I, I often I'm I think one reason I'm also really struck by focusing on to me like loss is isn't a one a one-time thing it's like it happens and it's a about social relations you know it's it, in context we all are sort of going through transformations all the time in our lives so um so um if we were around people at all different ages we would be highly much more aware of all the shifts in people's lives and i think we would it wouldn't be this remarkable thing to be like oh all my friends you know now like i've heard many 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 anarchists say once you have kids you have to step out of anarchism because you know there aren't people don't think about spaces, you know, including, and usually they think about childcare, put the kids in the other room as opposed mm -hmm. to what, you know, some book fairs, for instance, that I've really appreciated. They're like, we don't need to just sort of warehouse kids in a room with some toys. We could actually create programming for the kids or for all ages, right? You know, or we could, they're human beings. We could actually think to do things for them you know, that they would enjoy during this time, games, whatever it is. And so I think partially we need multi-generation spaces because if we're not around all sorts of people at all different moments, we only think that parts of our lives need that care. So maybe it's it's almost no wonder, you know, it's not that people are bad and they disappear from anarchism or they don't have the, you know, the backbone or the the resilience or whatever it is. But it's like it, it, it's our, the infrastructure we have created, which is some of it's super good, mm -hmm. is for a specific part of specific moments of life. And actually the bulk of what 
increasingly, um, I've really appreciated the folks doing the mutual aid disaster tour for putting out, doing workshops, which are starting also similarly to get people to think about how are we prepared? And it, to me, it's like, it's not even disaster because we're, you know, they say this too, this, we, you know, it should just be mutual aid, <laughs> but you know, disaster, I think we're, we're increasingly the disaster is every minute. They say that on their tour, but getting people to really circle up too and start thinking about, oh, are, are we prepared for all the disasters that are going on right now, which aren't just a hurricane coming through there, you know, as you pointed out, many, you know, not just disasters, but just things that happen in our lives because kids aren't, aren't a pure disaster. You know? <laughs> so, um, so, um, yeah, so I think number one, we, we need to really think about cultivating ways to think about the whole of our lives. Mm -hmm. But I also, there is a way in which we live in a culture that tells us because we don't talk about grief and loss and death, particularly, we're so removed from death, even more than we are removed from birth. At least birth, people post lots of happy, you know, Instagram photo. I mean, people, you know, on Facebook, if you say, I have a baby, you'll get like 500 likes, you know, if, and oftentimes people have someone that dies, people feel, say really awkward things and don't know what to say. And mm -hmm. mostly they're kind of insensitive things, but not meaning to be because people don't know what to say. And, you know, and you won't get as many likes, which is not a barometer. It's just, yeah. that's unfortunately where people are expressing these it's monumental the things, express is which like, is yeah. really awful too, finding out about those things online. Um, in both cases. But I think that we're so removed and we're sort of everything is toward youth culture and staying beautiful forever and, you know, being beautiful and being agile and no one wants to, you know, growing old is somehow awful and once and you have to give up your life. And you, so I think there's this real way in which it's seen as a negative. And I'm like, wow, it, in this society, you are so fortunate if you are able to grow older, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you're a, a trans femme of color, mm -hmm. like you are, you are not likely to grow old right it's horrible that like structurally i'm talking structural violence right if you're mm -hmm. a young black man or all these other categories an indigenous person you know all these other categories that shorten lives and so why do we see that as not part of like that should be something we should be trying to encourage that everybody needs to have as long and meaningful lives as they can if they want but I don't know, I think, I think for me, traveling around, I've been really struck by, we need to really start thinking through of how to really cultivate and curate multi-generational spaces. And again, it's not that we're bad. Someone said to me the other day, which I was really struck by, they said, you know, for most of human history, it was totally the, the cultural fabric that most people lived in multi-generational communities, multi-generational houses, increase, but increasingly it's not our fault. There's mm -hmm. something called gentrification and rent increases and foreclosures that rip, push people miles apart from each other there's you know we're we're ta we're taught that you know a certain age group has to be in one classroom and another age group has to be in another i mean all these ways in which we're compartmentalized from each other you know you only do this kind of thing at this point in your life it's there's it we're not again just bad people that aren't smart enough to figure this out <laughs> so how do we fight all these structures that actually have have torn us apart which is a challenge so we have to with intentionality create co curate multi-general spaces and in those I think we would come up with better ideas for caring for each other and so part of to come back to because I'm circling around to what, what your question was which I think is is more and more intriguing to me and myself included is I keep saying oh I, I know I want to do more I feel drawn toward doing death and, and grief work what would that look like as an anarchist mm -hmm. I also for a living edit books they're in my backpack I can live out of my backpack and increasingly I do <laughs> And I can, my work can go with me. And I feel, and this comes out of my, my non-religious Judaism, community is a key category for me. And I understand that my community and the people I love the most and, and are so increasingly spread out all over the place. So for me, the challenge pre the state of Israel that people that were Jewish had is how do you maintain community without a state? Mm -hmm. And I heard um, William Anderson speak the other day about um, as black, um, as as black as I'm going to get the title. As black as resistance. resistance. I'm sorry. As black as resistance. I was so moved, um, but he said, "Oh, I, you know, I came to anarchism through, for most of, you know, our history from being enslaved and brought to this continent. As blacks, we have not considered part of the state, and so I understand ourselves as keeping community and, and culture and care and cohesiveness as much as we can against the forces that have been trying to kill us." Without a state, and that's what led him to anarchism too. And I was like so struck. I was like, "Wow, that's so." How do we how do we do this in ways? And for me, so I'm traveling around, and I really do believe when I'm in a place, like how do we? I'm for me. How do I? 
really be where I am and create community, be intentional about going. A lot of anarchists, we do that. We go to repetitively to spaces and see each other, or we try really hard to create an infrastructure. But then I'm like, well, how can I be doing grief and care work when that seems to have to be so rooted in a place? And then I was talking to a bunch of other folks who are pretty mobile who want to do this, and we were all like, wait, a few of us could actually become sort of mobile. Yeah, and when someone, when like a hurricane strikes, is people come in that know how to do logistics mm -hmm. to renovate houses, and people come in that have supplies or know how to do f um, physical first aid, and there could be those come in to let people figure out how to grieve through those moments too. You know, that could be one idea. And I was like, oh, because I want to do this work. And it was this epiphany for me. To, I want to do this work for radicals, for people that are experiencing structural loss. Mm -hmm. And it's personal loss. That's why, that isn't just I want to volunteer for some random hospice, right? So how do we think about that? And last night at Firestorm, where you were there, I was like looking around the bookstore because it's so gorgeous and it's such a beautiful space and they've worked so hard against all the structural challenges that make that space so difficult to survive. I, I really want to encourage people that have a chance to see that space. It's so easy to walk into that space and go, oh, it's so beautiful and thriving. This is an amazing space. And there's so many ways that space is barely able it's like to stay alive. <laughs> um, so I, I think people shouldn't mistake the fact that they are really, really committed to making that place look alive until its last moment, which is beautiful. When many spaces look like they're dying well before their time, that space is going to look alive until its last moment. But I was really struck by, wow, in, you know, we're so bad at thinking about creating similar spaces in our communities, collective, and people used to do this a lot more, in which we lost, you know, collective clinics, free clinics, or instead of assisted living places where we're going to be, if we're lucky, thrown with other people that we have no relationship through a church group or, a, you know, Medicaid, or if people have money, how do, why don't we think about structures that would when we need different forms of care, think about ways we could live in different forms of collective structures that would give us the kinds of living situations we want and take care of our needs in reciprocal ways, right? As people are going, which includes chronic illness, because I also don't want to just say that, you know, it's just when you get old, right? There's people that are experiencing, people with chronic illnesses feel profoundly let down by anarchist milieus too, because people are sort of like, oh, I'm there for you for the first two weeks of something that's happened or maybe a month or two. And I mean, I've learned really personally and politically with losses it's it it's not ever going to leave and it yeah. actually can get worse like pr i pretty much know now from personal experience that once you have a person die that you you love it's not the first few weeks or the first month it's it's the months afterward especially during that first year and into the second and you need people to remember that it happened and nine months later go hey i i'm still thinking you know i know you're still you know not and how do we do that when we're not around each other? So more and more, I'm like, how do we cultivate spaces where we're thinking to be around each other more so we can see the whole of our lives in multi-generational spaces and we have structures of care that allow for both the transience and the disbursement of what's happening to us, whether we choose to do it or we're forced to do it. Because as a Jew, I take that really seriously.